Hey everyone, welcome back to the Making It podcast. In this episode, we talked about how we're all using AI for YouTube and content creation and gave some tips on how you could potentially be using AI better uh, for creating your own content. Then we went into a slightly existential rabbit hole where Jamie ended up in a brief crisis. And uh, then towards the end, we talk about the rise of VTubers, that's virtual YouTubers like Quebblecop and where we see the future of AI and YouTube uh, in the next 10 or so years. So I feel like I've been using AI very sparsely in my business and for the clients that I work for. I think to, to give an idea, like the kind of maximum that I tend to do is uh, for kind of title generation, some thumbnail idea type things, but it broadly boils down to, I go and uh, find say 20 to 30 title formats that work really well. Uh, I brainstorm a hundred different topic ideas for the channel that I'm working with. And then I basically say to ChatGPT, hello, here are some title formats, here are some ideas, please smash them together in a way that's gonna make me go viral. Um, some do you actually decent have that results in the prompt of like make it go viral? Not <laughs> please. Smash I was like, together. does that actually please work? Does it, does it somehow make <laughs> yeah. it even better? Because <laughs> the reason I asked no, that is I feel... because I saw on Twitter someone say, when well, your prompt, what you should have at the end of that prompt in ChatGPT is take a deep breath and think about this before you respond. And I thought that was a joke. <laughs> But it yeah. actually makes the response of ChatGPT better by telling it to take a deep breath, which I don't understand because it doesn't breathe, but somehow it's, <laughs> it's great. So that's why I was yeah. interested if that actually makes an impact. It probably is breathing by now, but no, I, that, I haven't, I didn't say that exactly, but I do often speak to it like a child where like if I, and, and so this is a classic one, right? With the system I've just described, I think I do say, imagine, you know, imagine you're a YouTube strategist, blah, blah, blah. Here are some titles that have gone viral previously. We want to make an idea that has viral potential. So like there's there's some context that I'm giving to it. Um, but then the issue that comes out is like uh, it will, and this was something that uh, Kay He tweeted the other day and I replied to him with like my kind of vague solution was that he said, I am trying to generate some titles for my like, newsletter or something, I think. But chat GPT always comes out with a subject line colon subheading. Mm -hmm. And it's like a yeah. really, it's like a super, I don't know, a semi outdated way of doing titles and it definitely doesn't work for YouTube. And so particularly when I've given it a title format to stick to, I tend to then like literally write to it like a child and say, do you remember what I said? Do you see how insert example of something it said to me <laughs> does not adhere to what I asked you? And then it goes, oh yes, of course, sorry. And then regenerates basically the same thing. Um, but anyway, all this to say, that's as far as I've taken my kind of relationship with with AI. And A, I suspect I'm not using the right kind of prompt, but B, I think I'm not even thinking widely enough about how I can be using AI to integrate with, with what I do uh, for, for myself and for clients. And I just, I'm intrigued by how much you guys have used it. And um, I know you've been a bit more creative with, uh, with some of the things th that you've done. Mm. Yeah, I have no solution yet to the title problem. I, I've okay. been bugged by the same thing. Even when I'm like, do not use any colons, do not use hyphens, <laughs> take a deep breath. This is this is very important to me. All that stuff. <laughs> Even giving examples. I haven't had great success with titles. So Jamie, I'm curious to know if you've got any uh, tips on that. Um. No, not really. I have the same thing. <laughs> what you know, a podcast! It, with <laughs> no solutions whatsoever. <laughs> Everyone, just switch off now. It's not getting any better. Um, but for me, I, I, I have the same thing. as like you, you give it a bunch of different t um, title ideas, and it, it does the, the the colon thing. And I've, I, I found some of them to be quite useful at times. Um, but I've noticed that since ChatGPT arrived uh, on the horizon a year ago everyone just seemed to started to use those types of titles. They just sort of it were everywhere. And I, I think it's actually quite easy to spot those types of titles now. I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing because I think most people who watch YouTube probably don't know that those titles came from ChatGPT. Um, I will usually say, don't do it like that. Or here are some titles that I like that are not in that um, formula. And I'll mention not to use you know, particular types of grammar or certain words, and it does do a good job of sort of refining it. Um, but sometimes, as you say, George, it will still just ignore all of that and, and give you a, a generic output. And then when you have to say, you've done that wrong, this is what I said, 
then it actually on the second try gives you what you want. Um, so yeah, mm. it's, it's, it's a bit peculiar. Um, I, I mean, just to go away from the titles for a moment, I have been able to sort of use it for scripting or for hooks and that by using the custom instructions, which I know you wouldn't have had because you use the free version of ChatGPT, which is 3.5. I'm on the waiting list. I'm still waiting. I know, you're still on it. I, that, for me, it was an instant yeah. buy. It, like, four is very good. And it comes now of like a, a store as well where people are creating their own specific um, GPTs that you can use. And I, I've created my own, which we can mm. talk about in a bit. Um, but you can give it custom instructions. So, if, for example, when you said, you know, I'm a YouTube strategist or scriptwriter and da 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 you can essentially give it those instructions ahead of time and it locks it in. Mm. So everything that you ask it, it already has that pre-programmed. So one of the mm. things I have within my custom instructions is at the end of every response that you give me, please suggest three questions that you think I should ask you. So before I would be working with ChatGPT mm. and I would be you know, having this conversation with it, but I would always have to be thinking, what are the prompts? What do I want to say to it? Whereas now it just gives me three questions. And sometimes there are these little things in that I just wouldn't mm. have thought of, but I can ask and it gives me a better answer because of it. Um, I haven't done too much in terms of like the custom instructions. I haven't gone down that rabbit hole, but I feel like there's probably a lot in there that could be used when you mm. wanted to use that just specifically as like a title generator. Yeah, the only thing I've done with my custom instructions is just try to make it less annoying. Um, <laughs> yes, just for context, like custom instructions, they apply to, they're like a little thing you put uh, that you can put in on the website that applies to every message you send to ChatGPT. Um, so my custom instructions, I'm just looking up now, say, never mention that you're an AI, never apologize for things, never mention yeah. that information is beyond your scope of knowledge. Don't give disclaimers about not being a professional. Don't repeat things. Never suggest that I look for information from other places. <laughs> um, so yeah, and that, 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 that is ever since I put that in, it's been so much easier to work with. Yeah. Really? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It sounds like this, this is a non-negotiable. I think I, uh, I just, I don't think I knew enough. I don't know if it does a good enough job of like advertising what the jump is from 3.5 to 4 because, uh, or at least what you get when you go premium because I just thought, oh, the AI will just be a bit better and it'll generate better results. But I had no idea there was this other layer of kind of custom uh, ways you could interact with it. You get things like plugins as well. Uh, on, on the ideation front, some, uh, something I found really useful. So this doesn't help with titles, but it does help with coming up with ideas that you can then think of titles for. Um, if you, if you go to any YouTube homepage and you screenshot videos, I, ideally by most popular, you, you'll get a, a photo of the thumbnails, the titles and the view counts of each video. Right. Uh, and if you take that screenshot and you put it into GPT four, which can handle images and can read and interpret them. If you say, these are the 12 most successful videos on my channel. Give me a list of 10 other ideas that you think would do really well for me, get high views that are totally, that are, that are different to what is currently here. The answers I found are usually really good. Um, that like 80% of the answer is, is, is trash. It's no good, but 20%, like 10% is interesting. I wouldn't have thought of that. And 10, the other 10% is, yeah, actually that could really work if we tweak it. Um, and I feel like, I feel like a lot of, um, working with AI is just being patient and being willing to give it time and, okay, this is a good starting point, considering that I'm not speaking to a human being, but rather a computer that's just answered me in two seconds. This is really good. Um, so I've used that for some, um, kind of competitor research, um, analysis, as well as just coming up with ideas for channels yeah. I've worked with and that's so I recommend I find that the clearer the inputs the clearer the output um and so I spent a lot of time breaking things down into sections I mean very very clear and detailed with specifically what it is that I want and it does do a pretty good job of that um I, I think at this stage you're, you're right Gwilym in that it gets you sort of 20 percent of like useful information which you can apply to what you know 
Um, I think that's a good thing, you know, um, for, for world kind at this particular moment that it's not going to replace us completely, but it can, you know, be quite useful in a way. And I think as long as you see it as, you know, like a hammer or a screwdriver in your toolbox, um, you, you should be using, I think it's much better to sort of brainstorm with this thing as opposed to seeing it as a complete replacement. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's useful in the sense of that sometimes you can, you have a feeling, right? This is where I think AI lacks is it doesn't have feelings. Whereas as a human, we have that moment where we can see art or we can hear music or we can watch a YouTube video and we can say, there's something I like about that. You know, there's something that they said that was impactful to me, but you might not be able to verbalize it or really systematically break that down. What I've done before is I've sort of taken a hook, for example, of a video that I thought was particularly good, um, copy the transcript, put that into ChatGPT, and then said, you need to break this down into why they specifically work, what type of language do they use, what type of tone or voice are they using. I even sort of write down what's happening in terms of B-roll on, on the screen, what I'm hearing audibly as well in terms of music and sound effects. So I'm kind of like trying to paint this picture for an AI of, of something that they cannot see or hear or feel. And whenever I've done that, it then will give me a very detailed sort of breakdown of what, why that particular hook worked so well from like an emotional perspective and the tone of voice and the writing style. And once that's done, I can then feed it my version of a hook that I'm writing for my video or a client's video and say, can you write it in that same style? And it does do a very good job of it. And sometimes I've used the entire thing, right? So it's not just the 20%, it is, has been like 100%. But that's been like a very good way for me to kind of like use AI in a way where it can just take something that is a feeling and really put words to it. Um, George, I'm, I'm curious, uh, just to segue, kind of what, what's been, what was the kind of reasoning behind or lack of reasoning behind you not getting on the AI bandwagon and messing about with ChatGPT as much? Hmm. I think there was, there was probably... Uh, it was partly just time and uh, it feeling like a skill that need to be um, built up, uh, like a muscle that needs to be kind of worked out um, because it is, uh, I mean, even just hearing what you guys are talking about now, it feels like there's there's this learning curve that you kind of have to go through, which if you're tangentially in it, like I suppose I am, uh, you just more and more hear, oh, these are these other things that you need to do to produce a useful result. It sounds like that barrier is maybe reducing uh, with, you know, the, the integration of um, it being able to comprehend images and, and text on images and, and things like that. But I think it just felt like, uh, this is kind of like learning a new language. And uh, yeah, it was it was maybe a bit of laziness on that part. But um, yeah, not really a form of laziness you can afford in this space, I suppose, which is why I'm now like, okay, I'm three months late, six months late, but I, I do need to wake up. It's interesting. I feel like we're at the moment with AI, we're at the stage where, you know, when computers were just getting started, if you press the wrong button, like you'd lose all your data. And it was all like, you need to know how to use the computer before you start like doing anything. Um, whereas now like babies just like get handed iPads and they can just do it all very intuitively. I feel like we're like a, a year away from or two years away from AI being super intuitive where you don't need to do all this obvious um, learning curve stuff just to get it to give you reasonable results. Um, chat GPT-4 has got this um, has got this feature where you can just like call it. You can you, like press, like talk to it. It will hear your voice and it responds immediately. Um, it's got some limitations, so you can't give it custom instructions, for example, but I, th I think. But um, I've talked to the AI a few times, just like spitballing ideas, and it's really good. Um, and it, when it gives bland answers, um, you can just say like, hey, I, what am I not thinking of here? Can you give me some provocative questions? And I'm like, sure, here's, here are five provocative questions for you that you might have not thought about. Um, so yeah, I, I, I feel like maybe, George, if you wait long enough, maybe you just won't need to do all the boring stuff that we're doing uh, just to get it to work. It'll, it'll have caught up. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I guess that, that makes sense. I suppose it's just like, um, it, it almost feels like the difference between uh, building your own website and having someone build a website for you in that 
when you've built your own website, it's really easy. If something goes wrong, if like the CSS messes up or something like that, you just, you have an intuitive sense of like where to go and tweak stuff. And even if in, in two years, none of this was necessary, but that's like a kind of extreme case. Uh, but and by none of this, I mean like none of the pandering to the more dumb side of chat GPT. I think it, it probably does help just to have an understanding, at least in this period of, um, of the nuts and bolts of how it works and why it works. Well, not how it works, you know what I mean, but like how to interact with it at its most basic. And again, by comparison to two years time, like you say, this probably will be it at its most basic. Um, but hey, yeah, like you say, maybe it all becomes super intuitive and uh, in a few years, we don't need to worry. Okay, um, we've discussed titles, ideas, um, thumbnails, images, what are you what are you guys doing if anything around thumbnails and images my main my main two use cases are probably uh very basic ai photoshop to like remove objects expand the canvas so that it's 16, 16 by 9 um and fits youtube thumbnail sometimes yeah. adding uh, objects but nothing too advanced yeah i've used photoshop um, beta to use the generative AI, uh, very similar to what you mentioned there of, you know, swapping out uh, someone's hand from pointing to just removing it completely, changing the colors of certain things, adding in objects. Um, it's been very, very useful, actually, especially in certain types of thumbnails where, you know, we've got a drone shot of a garden that looks great, but you think it's just a bunch of greenery. It'd be nice if there was a person there, but we don't have that photo just typing that in man stood in garden and it just places this person and it can intuitively know that it's a drone shot and it gets the guy from above and it looks perfect. Very, very seamless. You know, we've used that and, and the video's done incredibly well because of it. And well, not because of that specifically, but like it, it wasn't off putting. It didn't look fake. It, it looked legitimate. And I've used this sort of AI in Photoshop now for, months and it's very good and it continually gets better um I, I do sort of worry that photoshop or adobe you know what they're like they're the money grabbers and so i'm waiting for them to say it's an additional <laughs> you know 15 dollars a month and you only get 50 prompts um you know it, it's very similar to a, adobe stock because i think that's also going to come into it because you know adobe stock was was used quite a lot for photos and videos whereas now you can generates photos and videos right from a single prompt the stock industry business is, is probably in a lot of trouble because people are going to suddenly say well we don't need the real photo because it, we can generate one that's based on hundreds of thousands of of that bird or that flower or whatever it is um and and so i'm interested to see what happens there because i feel like adobe's gonna have to make that money up elsewhere and i think it, for them it's probably a logical next step to charge for that feature um, but if someone can have a, com you know, a competitive tool that does that at a lower price or free, I think we're going to start to see people shift over there. Same like with what we've seen with chat GPT and, um, you know, the Bing version of that. And then you have Claude, which is another, um, like chat GPT competitor. And there's a ton. So I, I think at the moment we're sort of in like this gold rush age where all these people are trying out these different tools and they're all quite similar and no one really knows what the best one is um a frustration i've been coming across with with thumbnails um and this applies to, to thumbnails for this podcast on youtube actually is for working with people's actual faces um the ai from what i can tell with my basic understanding of it is not that great it can't um it, 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 you can't do much to a person's face without it starting to look really weird or the AI just turning their face into a totally different person, um, probably because of some restrictions on, on how it's used. And as we know, right, YouTube thumbnails, especially for podcasts, are predominantly people's faces. So um, the, it, at the moment, from what I can tell, I can't use AI that much to construct a totally different expression or anything. I can just use it to create like a nicer backdrop that I can then paste someone's face on top of type of thing. Um, and yeah, um, 
kind of waiting for what the solution to that is. I in a, if you've seen there's there's a YouTuber who does these really creepy um like rigs of people's faces in in Blender and it's just a kind of AI style face and then he manipulates them using computer technology so that this creepy human face is smiling and changing expressions all the time. Um, maybe the next step is YouTubers creating a super detailed 3D model of themselves and just getting it to do whatever thumbnail expression they want, putting that on top of an AI background. I saw a tweet yesterday where it took a photo, a still photo of an individual just stood on a plain backdrop. And then on the right hand side, it had like this bare bones model and they've made it move to do a TikTok dance. I don't know which TikTok dance it was, but it was dancing to this popular music and it, it just looked like a 90s video game. It was very basic. And then to the right of that was that same still, but it had the person moving like the middle pain did. And this, this photo had somehow turned into a TikTok dance. And it wasn't this front facing the camera and it looked fake. They were like turning and you were seeing this other side of their face, which you wouldn't have got from that original photo. But the AI had said, well, this is what we think it would look like. And it was, it was a movie. It was a video based off of a single still. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, that, that was nuts. That was insane to see that. I'll, I'll send you the link afterwards and you can take a look at it. But I think Willem's right in that you'll probably be able to feed it, you know, a hundred photos of yourself. And you'll probably be able to, I reckon, find another photo and say, put me in this exact pose. Like, do this. Like, I think we'll get to the point where you can say, you know, put me in Star Wars or Harry Potter or whatever, and you'll be able to be in the movie as that main character. I think that it will get to that stage where you can completely replace yourself. Yeah, I mean, that, that kind of raises the, the bigger question for, yeah, for me, and, and you kind of briefly touched on this anyway, Gwilym, but like, what what is... Uh, what is the state of play as regards the legality of kind of doing all of this and, uh, you know, m misrepresentation of things? And even I think of like, I think some new Google Pixel phone at the moment they're advertising, it's like, hey, if you and all your friends look ugly in a photo, just like press this button and you'll all be smiling. And there's just this, I don't know, there's this sinister tinge to things like that where... I, you just it starts to misrepresent what's going on. And if it's you and your face, cool. But do you have the right to do that to your friend if they haven't explicitly consented? And then beyond that, if it's you're fully animating the, the the bodies of people that you don't even know, like I'm, I'm, yeah, I just yeah. don't know where we are with that. I don't have, I don't have the. I think the bigger theme here is not only does Gwilym YouTube strategist not have the answer to this question, but <laughs> like neither does almost anyone. Uh, the, 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 like the theme I'm, the theme I'm hearing is that. Uh, from from people like people working at at um, OpenAI is that uh, a lot of people are very worried about AI safety, security, what the implications are going to be for basically all areas of human life, um, and oh, we just don't know. So I know YouTube are doing something now with AI similar to what they've done with product placements, where a little grey box will pop up on the top left hand side. The video saying this contains AI, um, AI um, generated things, but beyond that, I have no idea. Yeah, I remember you sending both of us, um, George, a video of Mo Gaudat on Diary of a CEO with Stephen Bartlett, and you were saying this is like a heavy podcast episode because he's basically saying you know the, the world's gonna end pretty much is what he was saying it's like the world that you know is not going to be the same people are going to lose their jobs things are gonna like I, I can't even get into it like it was the tip of the iceberg and it sounded terrifying with the way that he described it and I, I watched this this complete episode and it, it really made me feel quite unnerved in a way because you know he's a very smart individual and I personally believe that it will go the way that he says. I just don't understand how it can't. I feel like mm. we, well, he's we've the, had so much the, growth in the past year. It's only going to end up with us all in, you know, the matrix with like VR headsets on, creating a world that it hits all of our dopamine receptors 
and you're never gonna it's gonna be better than reality i ju- I just think that is like the long term sort of future of of humanity and it it does feel weird. Yeah, I think particularly from his perspective, so Mo Gauda, for anyone who isn't familiar, was or is the ex-CEO of Google X, I believe, um, which is their kind of like AI wing. And he, he, I believe, and this is all I believe, just remember that he kind of resigned because he was concerned about the the speed at which things are going. And he, he's become part of this smaller group of people uh, with similar backgrounds who have been uh, you know, signing petitions basically to heavily tax anything to do with AI entirely just to slow down the speed at which it can make progress so that people who are legislating for the issues that arise from that, be that people losing their jobs, even just so that there's like a pot of money set aside to at least in the short term, help the people who are going to be kicked out of work as AI rapidly increases. Um, So it's kind of one of those situations where I agree, it's like it's a doom and gloom type thing. But I think his position is kind of like, we just need to slow it down as much as we can so that we can have a better chance at figuring out what the, what the, the solutions thing. Like are. He, he makes that same point within in the podcast episode that it is essentially an arms race and that because of the power of AI and how much you could affect another nation, he says if China and Russia are developing their own AI, it's clearly to affect the West in some way. And so the West has to respond. And because of that, safety gets left at, at the side and we just build and build and build and we want to get to AGI, which is essentially like a, almost a sentient Skynet sort of situation. And I, I think that that's where it's going to end up because it's like, whilst you can say, let's slow down, you've got to have this collective agreement. And I, I just, that's never happened in, in human history. But the only thing is like, you know, people have always said, oh, well, there'll be world peace when there's aliens. You know, we'll say we're humans, we're one, we would need to work together. It's like, will that happen when there are robots in the streets, you know, starting to well, probably <laughs> be that. It'd probably just be AI is hacked like a nuclear mainframe and it's sending off nukes and whatnot. Like, because that, that is part of the danger is, is like this risk to humanity <laughs> where Mo Gaudet was saying, like, they could access nuclear codes, they could switch off the power grids, they could open um, the, the sewers and just flood the water. It's like. All of this could genuinely happen because it's it's all connected, right? It sounds Sorry, ridiculous. I'm, I'm laughing because I'm seeing I'm seeing George's slight smirk, and I'm thinking that because you sound we're like a madman. It doesn't probably, sound no. Real. We're probably all thinking that whoever's listening to this podcast is like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Only I because know. it's made deciding on uh, the best title for your next yeah. like grow veg video seems right. decidedly <laughs> unimportant. Yeah, yeah. We, it's really gone off the cliff. But I, I genuinely think that is the power of AI, and it's it's not just yeah. Gaudat. You know, it's like the UK government have said it. You know, Elon Musk has, has met with with Rishi Sunak a few weeks back. It's it's like a legit thing, but it, it just doesn't sound real. It sounds like sci-fi. And I think it's one of those things that will bite everyone on the ass because they're not prepared for it. I think it's like COVID. That's never going to happen. They're not going to do lockdowns. And then all of a sudden, oh, yeah, everyone has to stay at home. And, and people are like, hang on, is, it, is this real? I genuinely believe that there's going to be this moment with AI where the penny drops and it, it's going to be this insane thing that happens. I don't know what it is. But as Mo Gaudet said, he says there will be AI terrorist attacks. I believe that will happen. Like, what happens when they attack a bank and the cash is gone? Like, again, it sounds ridiculous, but I think AI will no. definitely get to that stage. And so when we're talking about YouTube videos, it's like, it's, it's so, it's such an insignificant thing. Mm. No, I agree. I, I, yeah, the, the smirk is only because I don't, I, I sort of instinctively Be- believe it and at least believe that that's a possible because that's what the people involved in it say i just don't have the answer i don't even know how to use chat gpt i'm scared <laughs> oh i know it freaks me out that's why after that mo gauda episode i genuinely like walked in nature and was like let me just experience this <laughs> and just enjoy this because i don't think the world is going to be the same like again like i sound like an insane person but i re- i remember pre-internet and sort of like how and pre the iPhone and how the world has changed from then. And I feel like the world has changed so much with AI in one year. It's like five years, 10 years, 20 years down the road. The world that we live in is going to be unrecognizable. Have you come across Eliezer Yudkowsky yet? No, I haven't. Oh, he's, he's like, he's like the high, the high priest of AI safety, essentially. Um, he's been, he's been talking about this for 
mate like a decade more mm -hmm. oh, wow. um and his 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 approach is very much like we're all gonna die um maybe uh, you mentioned we, we, him in another podcast actually i think i think i might have yeah yeah but yes there we go <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry for that. Happy way we can oh finish God, this. where do we go from here? Like, uh, let's bring it back so to how are you using Notion AI? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um. Oh yeah, yeah. God. Um. Is there a moral we can extract from this? I, I think you should just enjoy your life whilst you can. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was the thing. That was basically Mo's kind of summary at the end of Stephen's podcast. Stephen was like, "So, like, how do you how do you kind of stay positive?" And he's like, "Well, I am here now. I am happy now. I have a beautiful wife. Uh, you know, I'm breathing. It's good right yeah. now. Yeah, and that was it. That was yeah. it. It was like, well, right now. That's why yeah, I freaked me out week? because it ended on such a, a dull, sad. Like, this is the future. Get ready. Enjoy, you know, every moment moving forwards. It's it's scary. Mm. Wow. Well, the, the positive is that maybe in like a year, we could just feed these 12 or so episodes we made before we were killed by the robots into <laughs> an AI and then just produce infinite discussions. Yeah, George, Gwilym and Jamie will be talking on in the future. <laughs> As we decompose. <laughs> well, let's let's talk a more a little bit about YouTube and uh, VTubers, the virtual YouTubers. Um, oh, I, God, no. Okay. You, you don't want to talk about them? No, I'm they, just like getting in the headspace. I'm not, I'm getting in the headspace. They yeah. are incredible. So yeah, with v, VTubers, um, which stands for virtual YouTubers, um, they are essentially AI in some cases, and in other cases, it's like a 3D generated character that someone else is voicing. And over the past year, I'm seeing this trend towards sort of replacing yourself. Quebelkop is probably leading this. Uh, he's the person I've seen do this the most. Um, if you're not familiar with Quebelkop, he was a gaming YouTuber. And like all gaming YouTubers, he would have his webcam in the bottom right hand corner talking whilst he plays the game. He sort of fell out of love of, of playing video games and making YouTube videos. And he went and launched his own gaming company where he made these games and sort of advertised it to his audience. And he built a genuine game company. And within like the last two years, he started flirting with the idea of what if he could replace himself with AI. And so earlier this year, he launched V1 of the Quebelcop AI, which was essentially himself, but as a sort of a, a low quality 3D version of him. So it looked like him. And this was on his main channel. Yes, this was on his main YouTube channel. And so visually the webcam, instead of it being him, it was this 3D character that looked like him. And you could hear his voice, but the entire voice was made with AI. And so he didn't speak at all. He wanted to completely remove himself. And apparently, um, I, I don't know what the, the entire process for this, but apparently they allow sort of the AI to analyze the YouTube video because he'd play Minecraft. Like he'd record himself playing Minecraft and then the AI would then make the words to say that would match what was going on screen. And so it was very basic and it didn't sound real. So as he was like mining and he, the, the, the video would show a diamond, the Quebecop AI would say, oh, wow, diamonds, let's mine it. And, but it would say very basic things like that over, over time. And his audience couldn't tell that it wasn't him, that it was this AI version of Quebelcop. And you fast forward three more months, that the, the scripting part of it got much, much better. And it felt more realistic to him. And then he upgraded his 3D character to a photorealistic version of him. So similar to that TikTok video that we spoke about earlier, there is now a photo of Quebelcop which he's made to make Blink move his mouth that matches the words that he's saying. It looks at the camera, it looks back at the screen, and it just looks legit. And none, no one in his audience can tell that it's not real, but it's all AI. And apparently he has like a V3 or V4 that's coming out soon. It's even better. But he, he's sort of really pushing the boundaries of where um, YouTube can go. And so I'm really excited to see what other VTubers start to emerge in the future. Yeah, I, I mean, I, from what I heard, I don't know much about it at all. But from what I heard, his viewing figures have gone down quite a bit. 
I imagine it's hard for an AI, just even an AI to, at this stage, compete with real people. Um, yes, I suppose that's my kind of broader question is like, why would you want to do that? Uh, in his case, it sounds like he was kind of done with his, he was getting a bit sick of it, but wanted to keep the channel going. Who, who hasn't got a YouTube channel already would think, yes, I want to do YouTube, but I, uh, I don't want to have to like do anything at all. I guess that's kind of like huge, maybe what some huge automation companies. channels want to do. Um, yeah, huge okay. companies. We're going to generate like, it's just like they do with K-pop bands, right? Let's put together like a hundred different combinations of random teenagers, send them out, eliminate the 99 that don't perform as well. And we keep the one ex kind of the one in YouTube cases, maybe the very extreme one that everyone thinks is real. Maybe just just the voiceover that's not generated, that's, that's not linked to any real person, and those things take over. Yeah, I mean, just just to touch on Quibble Cop again, um, from from following him on Twitter, he says that on TikTok and Twitter, he has these reaction videos, so they're separate to the Minecraft stuff, but they're just sort of like him reacting to a video, and they're doing very well. He's getting millions of views on there, and I just looked at his social blade, and. Uh, his, his views have gone up, not down, um, by the way, Gulam. Uh, this year alone, he's made over half a billion views, which is pretty impressive. So in the last 30 days, he's generated 47 million views. Um, and so I think he's using a lot of his long form and short form to perform for him. And a lot of it is coming from those reaction videos. Um, I'm just looking now, he's got like 131 million views on a video. There's an AI video from him, 17 million views. Um, so he, he's doing very well with this. And I, I think in his case, he didn't want to be a YouTuber, right? So he he's happy to sort of like hand over his identity and kind of like let this YouTube channel run itself as an AI. But I, I agree with Willem. I think that the, the biggest use for this will be for corporations who it's like, how, how do we make ourselves interesting. Well, let's just generate a, a, a virtual YouTuber who could be the face of the company. Because I think there are a number of companies who have sort of done that thing, like Shopify, for example. But the issue that you have is that should that employee ever want to move on, you then lose the face of the brand. And that then is a large risk because if people start to enjoy that personality and they go, they're not going to recognize them in a the thumbnail. They're not really going to vibe with the content as much. Whereas if you have this essential intellectual property, this mascot that is associated with your brand, it's always going to work. And it doesn't have to be in a human form. You know, if you think of something like Pokemon, you have Pikachu, right? Or Mickey Mouse with Disney. These are mascots. Why, why could we not just have a, their own version of that, you know, on YouTube? You, you absolutely could. Yeah, I mean, no, what I was thinking more disturbingly was more that companies have massive stables of VTubers that are all competing against real life streamers, YouTubers, um, and that they then use those, uh, those um, VTubers to sell products. Um, uh, like it, it makes sense at the moment companies have to negotiate with real people who have difficult upload schedules and have like problems with brands what they just create creators and then farm out the the, the marketing stuff to them i mean imagine if you're a, a streamer you stream like i don't know 10 hours a day then you go to sleep you get on with your life you wake up and your competitor your vtuber competitor has been streaming for 24 hours and is continuing to stream for 24 hours and is getting more views than you. You just can't. Yeah, it's scary. Yeah, I, I think Quebel Cop is sort of the start of that, right? Like if he's if he's winning in the yeah. reaction niche against other reaction YouTube channels, it's only a matter of time before it gets to you know what what you're thinking is is going to be the future. Um, and, and like you say, where, where does that leave humans who are making content? It's, I mean, it's also worth saying though, do you think Mr. Beast enjoys filming his react videos? Uh, like people who film react videos, I don't have, I don't have a very good understanding of like the mindset, but I, I'm, I'm guessing that people who've been doing it for years do not enjoy it. It's just a way to make money. 
or it's just a way to keep the business going. Um, and so maybe we should be happy. Yeah, maybe we should be happy that humans are no longer having to make React content that is that is kind of. But isn't lazy that the interesting because, thing? Though, you know, is that if you are a human, you have emotions, and so you will react to a video. But if an AI is reacting, what does that actually mean? Because they can't react. They're they're emotionless algorithms essentially. Mm. And beyond that, what does that kind of mean for the person watching? Where the imp the reason you're watching a React video is to know what their reaction is, so that you can either associate with it or disagree with it. But if there's a knowledge that it's not a real reaction, I feel like uh, it just removes the pleasure in watching it. Clearly, I mean the data on Quebecop would would dispute that, but I wonder if there is a sense of like wow how interesting this is such a new thing wait what this isn't even him reacting but if in 10 years that's completely the norm i actually would now i think prefer to go and watch a real person that i know is a real person in the same way that mo got out i think made you know the comparison between like people will still buy classic cars even though there are you know there's an automated procedure for mass producing modern cars um in the same way that, you know, in 20, 30 years, 100 years in the future, even though there's going to be millions of AI, full AI books and novels that have been written, people will still think, ah, oh, I'd love to read something that I know is actually written by a real person. Um, and so I wonder if there's just an element of like recency bias, if that's even the right use of that in this case, that makes it interesting. But when it becomes the norm, when everyone's super, well, I need not finish my sentence. Um, uh, yeah, I mean... Yeah, I, I I do agree. I think I think that there's always going to be something um, compelling about watching a human doing something, because at this point we've got robots that can hit like consistently hit like half court shots from in in basketball. But would you want to like watch a team of perfect robots doing that or like for a whole um, for a whole match? Like not really. It's like they said at the end of. Um... The movie the world's end it's like to r is human i think that's the the important part is like humans have imperfections and as you say it would be boring if you had consistency and i think that was one of the things that did Mogaudet did talk about in that podcast was that art would become a bigger expression for humans i think we would embrace it more than what we currently do because and this is the interesting thing is like people say that you can't really replicate art and you, you cannot from a human perspective because it, it comes from your feelings. As I mentioned before, AI doesn't have feelings, but AI can create better art than humans because it's studied it. It's been fed so many you know versions of a particular painting. It can create its own version. But do we care about it when we know it's AI? But again, like, I think this podcast, you know, we're, we're probably going to wrap it up now, but I think that this episode <laughs> is just like what, more questions than it's answered. And I think that's going to be the case for a lot of this as sort of humanity is shaped in, in a number of different ways through artificial intelligence. All right. Thanks very much for listening, everybody. If you did enjoy this episode, please make sure you like and subscribe if you're watching on YouTube and uh, give the podcast a rating if you are listening on any of your podcast platforms. Um, and then he said, we've been the Making It podcast. Thanks very much. <laughs> Good night. <laughs>